short, and it's called I Was Never Very Good at Repenting. I keep my hands pressed close to my chest. I'm afraid if I move them, my heart might spill out in front of you. And we all know how much you hate that. My therapist asked me to write a list of all the apologies I would never give. The ones that singe my throat every time I breathe in oxygen, talking about the grocery list, your coffee order, if I need to bring our insurance card to the doctor's dad. I'm sorry my catchphrase is just a series of fox muttered under my breath. Six months ago you asked if I ever read that Bible you gave me when I was 11. I lied, nodded yes. I'm sorry guilt never crossed my mind when you smiled. Like that time my third grade soccer team won the championship and I let you carry me home on your shoulders. I'm sorry I stole your church offering to buy drugs and Taco Bell. <laughs> I'm sorry you still call me your little girl anyway. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, this is another short one and it's called Dementia. I prayed for Grammy to die. Once, at my father's church, sweat, chafing legs, a rash erupting on my thigh. Again, drunk in the back of a minivan. Someone was vomiting into a plastic bag up front, and I kept talking to the guy holding her hair about the way Grammy's wheelchair smells like piss and how her strawberry perfume has expired from her blouses. Her funeral was at noon on a Friday. None of the great grandkids knew why they were there, so they ran up and down the aisles squealing about the park after. All the grandkids compared memories to pictures, and Grammy's kids sighed in relief. They kept the casket closed. Um, a lot of my poems are pretty short, um, but this next one is kind of long, and it's divided into uh, four different short poems. So I tend to write about the same themes and images and different things over and over and over again. Um, but the name of this whole piece is called Four Years This Town. One, my dad has this Budweiser piggy bank, shaped like a bottle, filled with loose change and lint and a couple of 20 snuck from the cookie jar where mama hides her church money. This will take us all the way to the Grand Canyon, he told me once. We're leaving Monarch Rubber and that pastor with the wonky eye and all those trains that howl like wolves to the moon every night. If the Big Dipper could sing, twitch its handle and conduct the world around him, I bet the chorus would sound like the trains. When Dad talks about smoldering metal under burnt rubber, I'm too afraid to tell him the universe likes my voice more when it's static, white noise. But a smile grows under his beard. He says, Maybe we won't have enough money to get back home again. And just like that, I'm six years old, waiting to be buckled into the car seat. Two. The sound of metal wheels clicking down the railways reminds me of home. The horn blaring so loudly the ground trembles in its wake, and my bedroom walls rock in its rhythm. Trains have lulled me to sleep for years. The tracks are like stitches hatched across this town. If you tug at them long enough, our whole world might unravel, and all the cornfields and fracking wells and liquor stores will dissolve between our fingers. The neighborhood lemonade stands will forget the taste of our lips. The community pools, unremembering how to float our bodies, listen. For years, I've checked hidden between the folds of our county map, tucked within the crease that runs through this town. Trust me when I say pouring gasoline along the sidewalks. Filling the streets with smoke would be like toppling all the headstones in Belmont Cemetery. And we could pretend the town's conscience was cleared, but the bodies would still be here. This town is a graveyard. Our brick buildings, the intersection of Columbus and 44, are my ancestors, the ghost of the person I used to be. Three. When the day came for Dad to spend our Grand Canyon money on drugs, I understood. I even smoked them with him. The universe would hardly notice a few more clouds, a few more bar talk promises puked into the front lawn with the peach schnapps. Or maybe they were hauled off by the trains, the same ones carrying coal to fuel monarch rubber, the place where dad built his factory hands. He keeps his high school diploma tucked in his lungs clogged black, tar. Even when the wallets went swimming overseas, Dad could still name every vacuum model he made parts for. They sound like the mucus hacked into his palm wiped along his pant leg. 
There's this bar across from the BP where waitresses spend their tip money and the 50-year-old McDonald's manager cashes her paychecks. The bartender reads my last name between the creases formed around my eyes till a pinched aneurysm burst. I hear they hired a new woman who shakes a cocktail faster than ever, loves a good tavern, and knows how to keep one. The world kept turning even when my fathers didn't. His abandoned factories lay scattered, this town's rotting flesh, held up by sophomore boys pawing on familiar breasts and homeless men curled underneath rusted conveyor belts waiting for the library to open. The universe would hardly notice a few more skeletons mistaken as people. Four. Holding on to this disease would be like plucking the ruby leaves from the rotting branches of an antique oak. Unburying our old German shepherd from the backyard, my stepfather accidentally built a shed over the grave, so I guess we'll have to tear that down too. I have so many roots tangled in this town, the soil is starting to build in my ears sometimes. When I'm sitting in the wooden pews with Mama, I play with the dots of lint stuck to my dress, pretending to pick little pieces of this town away. There's this piggy bank hidden under my bed, filled with loose chains that whisper about grand canyons all around the world and cities I've only ever seen in pictures. But when I learn to live in maps that I cannot trace with my eyes closed, I'm sure they will whisper about the trains and brick buildings and smoke I have known for years. This town. And I think, maybe then, I will finally be ready to swallow it. Thank you. Um, so, not long ago I was given this writing prompt to write a poem that talks about writing poetry. So, um, it's like a poem written in command form, um, giving advice to people on how to write poetry. Um, but it's not really supposed to be about poetry either. It's hard to explain, but hopefully you'll kind of get the gist as I read these next two poems. Um, and this is the first one. Promise your baby niece, who is five, almost six, that you'll take her to the park next weekend. Forget to do it Saturday because of the grocery list, the three loads of laundry, say you were super tired from work that weekend anyway. Take her out the weekend after. Try not to take advantage of her automatic forgiveness. Explain those grown up things to her, like bills or how the cat's litter box actually gets changed. Write a poem she cannot understand about her squinted eyes and pursed lips when you say words she cannot understand. Follow her into the slides your ass is too big for, across the wooden bridges not meant to carry your weight and ask her why she put the play catch in next to the rock wall and not the swings. Write a few stanzas about her answer. Know that this is not your poem. It is hers. Thank you. The next one is also in that kind of command form, but it's a bit longer, um, and the subject matter is a bit darker. Grammy is dying. Listen to the drizzle of piss hit the hardwood floor. Measure how deep the craters of her cheeks have sunk against her bones. Use that as your opening metaphor. Write a few stanzas about her wheelchair, the nursing home. Avoid describing the bed sores, burnt red, pus crusting brown. Let your guilt get the better of you. Protect yourself. Don't mention the time you tried to spoon feed her and spilled hot soup on her shirt. Pretend she didn't cry from the burning. Devote a couple lines to the aides who stole $600 from the stash Grammy kept hidden with her underwear. Everyone enjoys a happy ending, so lie. Say they were caught, fired. Don't mention her angry sobs, too weak to throw anything against the wall. Stumble upon a picture of Grammy tucked in a moldy yearbook three weeks after she dies. Compare yourself to her. Realize you must have gotten your looks from the opposite side of the family. Sit at her grave. Don't comment about an eerie silence. Touch the grass that grows around her stone in a forest of granite. Wrap your tongue around all the names Grammys is lost in. Write a few more stanzas. Practice saying it out loud. Stop pretending that this was ever about you. Thank you. Um, so I tend to write about um, origin and where you form your identity and hometowns a lot. Um, so this is another poem kind of related to that, and it's called The Ghosts of Nemeshillen County. I grew up with the corn stalks, 
settled into the soil of haunted farmhouses, curled around the jagged circles of potholes left by my great granddaddy's six cylinder Fiat 527. They tell me his ghost still roams these fields, and when I look into great Grammy's milky eyes, which do not know mine, I swear he's in there, <laughs> coiled around her irises. My next door neighbor was a pump jack, its giant metal arm rising up and down, extracting oil, facing southwest toward the forest behind the elementary school, where Jessica found the skeleton of a deer during recess. We crowded around the carcass of this small deity, praying to its spirit in seances. We could imagine the deer as a little god protecting a world inside his skull, now buried above his ancestors, the fuel that propels our lives forward. And how could we not believe in ghosts? Amanda hears her granddad's cough in her mother's lungs, a golden camel perched on a cardboard box, the same way she feels her father's rage stomping through her veins even as her mother puts her whole hand to her mouth and asks who taught Amanda to say su such foul language in polite company. We grew into the words we didn't know, into the crooked noses of our parents, Hunter into his older brother's American spirit cigarettes, then into Red Man's chewing tobacco. But when Hunter's dad caught him with a piece nuzzled so comfortably between his lower lip and gum, the old man made him drink the water bottle of dip and spit until he threw up along the road. This whole town was a lesson on lingering, shrinking, <laughs> on being swallowed whole. Jake watched his mother's lips grow thinner in the church's wooden pews and in the passenger seat of his daddy's eight-cylinder F-150. And at the dinner table, until one night her tongue fell like a piece of veal into the mashed potatoes. Everyone said she cried and cried and boxed up her grandpa's framed picture, her best pair of work boots, and poof, just like that, Jake's mom disappeared. This was not our first taste of illusion. We'd seen magic in the way Alyssa smacked a home run on the exact moment a bolt of lightning cracked onto the field. The way our grandfather's skin changed to leather right before our eyes added splotches of moles, irregular edges. The calluses never faded, only the flush of red under the skin. They held American spirits between their teeth, passing down recycled clouds of tobacco that clung to the fabric of our Little League t-shirts. We spent our whole lives trying to blow it out of our bodies, but we can't seem to shake the smoke from our veins any better than the feel of two hooked fingers inside the eye sockets of our dear, dear skull and the weight of carrying it home with us. By the time we figured out that quarters could be spent on better things than soda from the vending machine outside the country corner mini mart that a bus pass could take you further than the edges of our town map, we had already memorized the lines around our mother's eyes, the back rows, the veins of this place, memorizing the look of dirt caked into our knuckles. We can never scrape this town from under our fingernails. Even in the years after we evacuated, there was always Nemeshillen County, nestled into our fingerprints, our calluses, making ghosts out of all of us. Mm -hmm. um, so I have two more poems left, and I would say that they're both love poems, although the first one isn't a very nice love poem. <laughs> um, so here it goes. $7 gas station vodka tastes better in my mouth than your name. I kept the plastic bottle between my knees as you foisted yourself onto the truck bed. Grass clippings seasoned our bare legs. My lips tunneled clear liquid into raw throat. I said it tasted like my dad's favorite insults. You smiled, loving the way my mouth looked around something hard. Truck tires rolled under our asses while cornfields passed at 10 miles per hour. You thought the engine humming was my heart beating, but really, it was just the vodka looking for a way out. Now, I could have swore your mama taught you better than this. Taught you the key to a happy marriage with a clean shave and a car door held open while my dress trailed behind me. I guess it was my fault. The three beers going stale in the back of your fridge should have been a sign. You would never know how to tear a screen door from its hinges, the color of puke stained under the toilet seat, how to forgive yourself when you knew better the first time. The engine muffles your voice. You tell me my blue eyes match the sunset. I roll them and pick straw from my hair. Oh no, honey, I think your mama was right. You are too good for me. <laughs> And this is what 
uh, my last poem and is what I would call a, a happy love poem. <laughs> when the butterflies I had for you died in my stomach, they molted into the roots, tangled around all the bones in my body. Like our legs, the Wednesday I wore my best skirt, like the cherry stems, the moonshine, our silence. I couldn't forget you if I tried. My hands have turned shovel to pull apart years of soil packed down by steel-toed work boots, a Bible I never read, unopened bills. But when, your hand, but when my hand is pressed to your chest, you smile, massage my knuckles. Remark how clean my nails are. Tell me how your fingers have been struck stiff, curled inward. You say you know nothing else but that porch swing, that pizza shop working your daddy to death, those bulldogs clicking paws against the tile, remembering my smell, licking my toes, telling me I'm home. We walk past Nichols Bakery, honey, bread, freshly cooked, dips into our lungs. We watch the factory workers smoke cigarettes outside the building. The knots in my hair are part of the overgrowth you never asked me to trim. The sun drops below the brick wall. You tangle your fingers between mine and ask if I prefer chai from Starbucks or Mary Ann's. I smile, feeling a seed take root. A sprout pushes through what I thought was a grave, and you're still beside me, entwined, wanting to know the answer. Thank you. Thank you.